just did that. Yeah. Hey, are we live? Oh my gosh, this is phenomenal. Oh my gosh, what do we do now? You guys, my name is Father Mike Schmitz. I am so grateful for you joining us tonight here. Um, I know last couple of days I've been saying uh, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Here it is, 7.03. Classic, classic me. Um, <laughs> I'm so grateful that you're joining us here this evening. Um, one of the things we just wanted to do, we wanted to kind of do a couple of things. The first thing we wanted to do was we wanted to create an opportunity. You know, I said this at, I think, one of the online masses that we've done recently. It's that uh, when we have the masses, it's kind of a one-way deal. Um, I, I, I was at the mass. We're all coming together. We're all praying to the Lord. We're praying with each other, even if it's this weird, you know, kind of virtual kind of thing. At the same time, uh, it's kind of one, one direction, right? In the sense that it's just kind of like me talking. The, the great gift is going to be able to uh, talk with each other. And so... As you probably know, throughout the course of the night, we have we have an hour or so together. Uh, over the course of the night, what we're going to do is we have an opportunity for questions and answers. A number of people have already submitted their questions, and so we're gonna we're gonna launch into this. Um, but if you have any questions over the course of the evening and put them into the chat, that would be awesome. They'll hopefully hopefully your question is gonna be picked, and hopefully, well, I'll do my best to answer those questions. Oh, of course, over the course of the night. We're also going to introduce you to a couple different people, um, basically people that we work with here on campus of the University of Minnesota Duluth, Bulldog Catholic. And so I just wanted to introduce you to them. And thirdly, uh, this day is what we call our Give to the Max Day. So all throughout the state of Minnesota, um, nonprofits across the state uh, basically take this day and say, hey, we're trying to do good work. Would you mind supporting us in the mission that we have? And so that's what we're doing here today as well. So it's kind of a threefold deal. One is trying to answer whatever questions you might have. Secondly, you get to introduce, you get to be introduced to some of the staff that we have here on campus. Unfortunately, tonight it's just you won't give, you won't have a chance to meet any of our students until the very, very end of the night. Um, but they're they're cream of the crop. They're top shelf students. And then thirdly, of course, is uh, this give to the max day. And and so if you want to go to bulldogcatholic.org/donate, you could do that. If you just want to stick with us for the next hour or so and have questions, hear some answers. That will be incredible. I'm just so grateful that you're taking the time tonight uh, to join us. So that's that being said, I think it's probably good to, to jump into the first thing. Like, why waste any time? So here we are. Um, our first person who's going to be our host, there'll be five hosts over the course of the night. Our first co-host is Lauren Hopke. Lauren, come on in. Um, so Lauren, <laughs> Lauren is our director of events and communications and marketing here at the University of Minnesota Duluth. She had been a missionary on our campus for four years. Um, and now she's been on campus. This is her second year and not that position, but in the position of the communications and marketing and events person. So Lauren, hi. Hi, Father. <laughs> so I have a couple of questions that have come in already. Thank you so much. Um, so Jody Alisco, she is, her first question says, thank you, Father Mike. My husband and You're I- You're welcome, Jody. <laughs> my husband and I did Bible in a year in 22 and are finishing up Catechism in a Year with you now. We love it and have learned so much. What's next? Awesome. Well, Jody, thank you so much. Um, and your husband too. I want to know, uh, hopefully you were able to, maybe you did it together. I know my mom and dad, when they went through the Bible in a year, they would almost, they would press play. Whenever they press, press play, they almost always, I think, did it together. And so hopefully you and your husband were able to grow in that way, especially even with the catechism as well. I think that's can be such an incredible way to do this is by going through this together. So thank you for doing this. Hope, also, if you want to put it in the chat, if you guys have done, if you've done the Bible in a year and the catechism in a year, um, what's your assessment? Like, what do you think? What, what, what's the difference? I think I'd be really interesting to hear is like, you're like, oh, it's the same or it's so different. How is it different? Or how is it the same? So what's next is a big question. <laughs> That's the question, Jody. Thank you. Um, the question is what's next? Um, that I think I get asked maybe five times a day. I've heard everything as people suggesting things like, um, theology of the body in a year. I heard that twice yesterday. Um, the Summa Theologica in a year, which I've heard a couple of times. Um, saints in a year, that would be also a really great thing. Um, a lot of other things in a year. One of the things though, <laughs> the person I have to listen to the most after the Lord is um, my bishop. <laughs> and so my bishop has said, Father Mike, here's what I'd like you to do in the next year is we have this little house here that we run all of our operations out of up here at the University of Minnesota Duluth. And so it's a split level house, split level house. I live up upstairs and the rest of the house belongs to the students. And so where we have mass on Sundays um, for the for the online mass is a little two car garage that we've converted into a daily mass chapel. So during the week uh, we have maybe, I don't know, 60 students or so, 60, 80 students uh, who will cram into that space. It's up to fire code, by the way. Um, and, <laughs> um, and, and adoration all day, 
virtually every day of the week, we have to go on campus for our Sunday masses. And so because of that, my bishop has said, hey, Father Mike, I want you to build a church and a Newman Center right across the street from campus. And so right on the land we're on right now, after being me being on campus for, I think it was 17 years, we finally were able to, like God did a miracle and opened up uh, the whole block. We were able to actually purchase the block. So we've, we've owned the block for almost two full years now, and it is time to, um, to do what we can to build. And so what's next this year is basically trying to uh, get the resources to build a church and get the resources to build a Newman Center. So that's a great question, Jody. Thank you. Um, and maybe after that, we can then really like launch into whatever the next in a year is going to be. Awesome. Um, so this next question comes from Johanna Cost. Co-ask, excuse me. Uh, you've said that we should consult God in everything we do and wait patiently. What do I do when it's time to come, when the time comes to make a decision, but I don't hear God's voice? Oh, Johanna, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, okay, so we have to consult the Lord. Obviously, we want to ask God what His will is, but then at some point you need to make a decision. So I remember when I was in uh, college, and it was the time to, I, I was getting closer and closer to graduation. And I was seeing someone and I was also uh, being applying to be a missionary. And also I was trying to discern seminary. And at one point I was talking to our college chaplain and I said, uh, Father Tim, Father Timo, it was his name. I was like, Father Timo, I'm like, what do I do? And he's like, well, just pick one. And I was like, no, I just, I, bet I, I, I can't just pick one. Or what if I pick the wrong one? He's like, just pick one. And I was like, easy for you to say, you're already a monk. You already, you already <laughs> figured it out. And he was right though. In some ways, at some point, um, sometimes people picture Faith is like a, they say faith is le like a leap of faith. I think faith is rarely a leap. It's almost always a step. And so, for, for in my case, it was okay. It, whether, whether it was pursuing this relationship, it was pursuing the the call to be a missionary or to go to seminary. God was just giving the leaving the door open for me to take a step in one any direction. And so, Johanna, for you or for any of us, whenever we have a number of options in front of us, at some point, as we're listening to God's voice, at some point, we just have to move. So I, yeah, I love this image. And this image is, um, so right now in Minnesota, we just finished up our deer hunting season. I apologize if this is offensive to anyone, but <laughs> we just finished up deer hunting, right? Rifle season, I think, right? Finished last week? Something. Like, it's whatever. We're in rifle season. So if you, when you're going to go hunt deer with a rifle, you don't just show up with your rifle that day and like take aim and just shoot away. What you do is weeks beforehand, you take your rifle to the shooting range and you you line it up and you have, it's called sighting in your rifle. So what you have to do is you have the scope, you have the target out there. And then at some point you put the crosshairs like on the target and then you pull the trigger. You have to actually pull the trigger. You don't just like line it up and then just say, oh, that looks good. You have to line it up and then actually pull the trigger. You have to do something. And if it's off, then you make an adjustment and you line it up and pull the trigger again. If it's off, you make an adjustment, and line it. but you don't wait until opening day to do that. You do that when it's an easy decision. You do, that, you, you do that when it's not easy, but it's, that's the leap. If you were to do it on opening day, that'd be the big leap. But if you do it like when you're sighting in your rifle, that's the step. But at some point you have to pull the trigger. Like at some point you have to take the step because you'll you'll never know until you, you'll never know if you won't go. You never shine if you don't, <laughs> you don't glow. Um, hey now, you're an all-star, Johanna. I know, so what I'm saying is it's true. It's, it's, you guys, you can also laugh in the background if that's if it's something's funny. There's a room full of, <laughs> people, room full of people in here. <laughs> and so there's a laugh track, and this is like sign or sign filter, friends. Um, so that's what I would say is Johanna, if you get to that place where you've you discerned God's call, you have your your target is lined up in your sights. At some point, you just take that step, pull that trigger, and then assess. Do I need to reevaluate? Do I need to take another step? And if so, then line it up again and take another step. So discernment involves often making a decision, which almost always involves courage, taking that step and risking maybe even making a false step. That's okay. Because as my priest had said, said, just, just choose, just go. And it all worked out. Awesome. Okay. So this next question comes from Cynthia Castellanos. I'm not great with names. Hi, Father. Uh, what is the Hi, <laughs> what is the image of Mary that hangs behind on the wall behind your videos? Uh, what is the name of it? Where'd you get it? Thank you. Yes, thanks, Cynthia. Um, that is a really quick answer. Uh, that is from the Pieta. So Michelangelo carved this sculpture of uh, Jesus after he was taken off the cross in Mary, our mother's arms. And so it's this massive sculpture. It's in St. Peter's Basilica. And this is a photograph of uh, the close-up of Mary's face. And so uh, that's what it is. It's the Pieta, Mary in the Pieta. Um, 
and also I, I think I got it from allposters.com <laughs> like back in 2005, maybe something like this, uh, 2006. I was looking at some art in this in this room. And, and so what you can't see is maybe you can see it a little bit. But so this is Mary right here. And then in the middle is a mirror. And on the left side or whatever other side this is, it's, it's Bernini's David. So you're all, you're all online right now. So just open up another tab and type in Bernini's David. And this is a close-up of David's face. This is another sculpture. Now, we all know Michelangelo's David, right? He's just kind of like standing there and just hanging out, like whatever. Um, Bernini's David is amazing. My little brother went to study in Greece and in Rome, and he went to wherever the Bernini's David is. And he came back and he showed me this image of it. He, and I, I love it because in this David, he's actually moving. It's, it's an action shot, basically, an action sculpture of David battling Goliath. And the look on David's face, he's kind of like, he's like, you know, biting his lips as he's fighting as he, as he has a sling. And I just love this because the idea behind this was when our students come up here and they stand right here, uh, that our, our the young women can look at our, our lady and say, okay, she's my model. And, and the young man can look at David and say, okay, he's my model. And then they can look in the middle and say, that's where I'm supposed to be too. I'm like, I'm supposed to be up there as well with David, with Mary, with all the saints. And that's, that's the concept behind the whole thing. And I got it from allposters.com. And I don't know if I've, I've looked back to see if I can find them and I can't find them anymore, but that's where I got them. That was the longest answer for the <laughs> shortest question. But thanks, Cynthia. Well, that was my last question with you guys, but there's someone new coming. Abby's coming next. Uh, but I just want to say thank you guys for letting me hop in with you guys. Uh, at the end of the Bible in a Year and Catechism in a Year podcast, um, Father Mike always says, you know, pray for me. I'm praying for you, uh, which is so true. Every morning, every person in this room, this is our, our staff and, and some of our students in the room with us. We gather together from 750 to nine every morning and pray morning prayer together. And there's an opportunity for intercessions. And every morning uh, we're praying for you guys and lifting you guys up, lifting up your intercessions, wherever your hearts are at. So uh, just know when he says that in the podcast, uh, he means it. And our whole community means it. We're so grateful to know that the boundaries of Bulldog Catholic bust out of the city of Duluth. Um, and so your prayers and financial support uh, means the world. And so bulldogcatholic.org slash donate is uh, the link if you want to financially support, but please know that we are praying for you uh, and so grateful to to spend tonight and, and every week with you guys. So thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Lauren. Um, it's such a gift, uh, an opportunity to be here. Hopefully, we'll get some more, more get through more questions as people keep coming on. Um, so that was Lauren, as I mentioned. She's the director of events, marketing, communications. But also, our next person, next co-host is Abby. Abby's a first-year missionary. Hi, Abby. Hi, Father Mike. <laughs> Abby's a first-year missionary. She is from down south, so if you, she has an accent, it's okay. She's from Iowa, <laughs> and so. Um, <laughs> but Abby's, as I said, a first-year missionary. Abby, where did you where did you do undergrad? I did undergrad at Loris College in Dubuque, Iowa. So go do Hawks. Go Hawks. Right? Yes. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I love so, it. And then were you what what did you do back in undergrad? Like what was your thing? Yeah, well, I ran cross country and track. And then I also majored in biochemistry and Spanish. So a little bit of a nerd. Um, <laughs> pre med track. Want to be a, a women's health doctor. Awesome. Thanks, yes. Abby. And are the, what's our next? Yeah, our so next question? our next question comes from Esme Harris. Thank you so much for your work, Father Mike. What advice do you have? for a Protestant looking into Catholicism, especially if they don't really know any Catholics. Asking for a friend, winky face. <laughs> awesome, thanks. Um, Esme, thank you for asking this question because it's it's one of those ones that we get a lot, uh, a lot of times here. Um, I always say that the two best questions a priest can ever hear is, Father, will you hear my confession? And how do, how do I become Catholic? That's Those are the two best questions ever. Um, so Esme, um, the, the thing is, I would say that the easiest part of becoming Catholic is reading your way into the faith, right? So it's, it's like learning what the Catholic Church teaches and being like, oh my gosh, this is beautiful. It's true. It's good. It's all these things. At some point then, so we have people who will sometimes say, hey, can we jump in on your RCIA classes? Because the right of Christian initiation for adults is how oftentimes people become Catholic. Um, and we just jump in on your classes and we do it online and it'll be all fine. And it, there's a temptation to say yes, because it's like, well, I think our classes are pretty good. But it would be the wrong thing if we said, yeah, join, <laughs> jump in our classes and then come up here on Easter Vigil and become Catholic. Because being Catholic is not just about recognizing the truth of the church's teachings or the beauty of the church Christ founded or the goodness of becoming holy in the church. It's actually being part of the community as well. It's, it's saying yes, not only to the fact that God has instituted his church, right? He built his church on the rock foundation of Peter's confession, um, but it's also the uh 
the humanity of the church. It's also the reality that the bride of Christ is tangible. Um, C.S. Lewis, no, not C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien. Uh, Tolkien, I just came across this quote from Tolkien where he talks about how good it is. He says, you have the ideal. We have the ideal of the Catholic Church. And the ideal of the Catholic Church is still true. Again, it's good, it's true, it's beautiful. It's, it's all those things. But at some point, we have to come in into contact with the real church. And that in, that is the the uh, the person who sings out of tune. That's the person who smells bad when they're at church. That's the person who's really annoying. That's the person who drains on us, is drained for us. It's a person who who professes something but lives a different way. It's it's all it's the mess of the church. And so my invitation is continue to read and continue to study, continue to pray. Yes, do all those things. But at some point, we have to like darken the door of the church. Now, at the same time, some churches aren't ready for you. <laughs> what I mean by that is some people, sometimes people, I, I've not heard stories of people show up and like, they're like, I'm here. I want to be Catholic. And like, oh, okay. Well, our classes start in September and it's already November. So I'll see you next year. Like that would not be a very good way to handle someone knocking on, on the door of the church because they might not be used to people who are knocking on the door saying, I, I want to be Catholic. So be patient. So knock on the door, but be patient. That's what I'm going to invite you to do is so basically you might even want to call or send an email to your local Catholic church and just say, here's where I'm at. Uh, who, who do you recommend I talk to? And they might not know the answer right away, but keep knocking. Remember what Jesus said. He said, everyone who knocks, there will be open. If you ask, you'll receive. If you seek, you'll find. When Jesus said those words, it was the, the tense of the verb to seek, to ask, to knock was keep seeking, keep asking, keep knocking. So my invitation to go to your Catholic church, whether that's on the phone, uh, through an email, or actually at the door, and keep asking. Say, this is where I'm at. Here's, I'd like to become Catholic. And I don't want to pause. I don't want to wait. Um, and if they don't know what to do with you, keep asking, keep knocking, keep seeking. That's what I would say, if that helps. Yeah. Thank you, Father, so much. Uh, the next question is a little bit lighter. It comes from Holly Bagley. And she says, do you ever tire of wearing black and white? Oh, my gosh. Yes. Holly, <laughs> thank you. Oh. <laughs> Holly, so here's the thing. I don't like tucking in my shirt. I don't like dress pants. I don't like button down shirts. I don't like putting my collar all the way up. To, I can't breathe. I can't, I can't breathe always. So, so I'm constantly not being able to breathe. And everyone's always like, why do you always undo the top button of your collar? Because I can't breathe. That's why, Holly. Thank you for asking. I finally get to let everyone know this. I don't care about the color. The color doesn't really matter. Um, it's just the uh, man. Although this, okay, I have to say this right now. Um, right now, I, someone made, got, got me this shirt and it's the wife of a Lutheran pastor. And she designed these clerical shirts that are like four-way stretch. So they're like kind of like Lululemon kind of thing. They're, it's called the Wicking Vicar. And uh, Wicking Vicar is the name of the, the website. And they, they're they really comfy. So if any priests are out there, or maybe you want to give a gift to your priest who wants to like stretch while he's moving, mm -hmm. these are the most comfortable clerical shirts I've ever had. So Holly, um, I don't tire of wearing black, but I do sometimes tire of wearing dress clothes. You just been working out too much, Father. That's it. That's just too tight on me. <laughs> Sweet. Well, our next question comes from <laughs> Beth McCall, and she says, I went on a pilgrimage to Our Lady of Guadalupe and asked for healing. I did not receive a miracle. How do I not be disappointed? Yeah, Beth, that is a big deal. Uh, that is a really big deal. Um, how do you not be disappointed is a great question, because how many people have gone to Fatima, have gone to Lourdes, have gone to Our Lady of Guadalupe? And they've received healing and they come back and they're there's incredible incredible stories right people who will have these glory stories about i prayed and god heard my prayer and answered my prayer in the way that i'd asked especially when you make that that leap of faith right that or that step of faith by going to a pilgrimage site knowing that here's where our lady re revealed herself to the people of this continent here's where our lady did a number of miracles and so why why, why not you like why how do you what do you do when you don't get that miracle um, it's a great question. There's a, I want to say two things. One is, um, there's this church I visited once. It's in Fargo. I mean, uh, Fargo, North Dakota. I don't recommend going there, but like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just kidding. It's a great place. Um, they have an incredible, they have a great Newman center as well at NDSU. Um, go Bison, go do Hawks, mm -hmm. go Bulldogs. Uh, so, but there's a church called St. Anna and Joachim. And, um, one of the things that I was so struck by is all the way down the the uh, the aisle towards the altar. 
there are these side altars where you can go and you can pray. And like in the very, very back, there's the chapel, the side chapels, the chapel of mothers, and then on the other side, chapel of fathers, and then it's the chapel of missionaries and the chapel of contemplatives. It's just really this, it's like this point counterpoint. The very closest chapel to the sanctuary is the chapel of miracles, like healings. Like when, and it's, it's, uh, it's occasioned by all these times where God heard someone's prayer and like healed them. But also the, uh, the point counterpoint is called the chapel of providence. So on one hand was the chapel of healing. The other was the chapel of providence, which is that sense of God in your providence, in your will, in your love for me, sometimes you heal. And sometimes in your love for me, you don't heal. And this is the thing we have to understand. God, in your love for me, sometimes you heal. And sometimes in your love for me, you don't heal. And this is the second thing. This last week, not not this week, but the la but last week, we honored the the sixth anniversary, commemorated the sixth anniversary of a young woman in our diocese. Um, her name was Mal. And when Mal was 14 or 15, she was diagnosed with cancer. And she spent the next year, uh, la again, last week was the sixth year of her death. In that last year of her life, this 15 year old girl, uh, she regularly said this. I remember it was so, it was a Tuesday um, that we were at a youth minister meeting here in the diocese, in the, in the city of Duluth at our diocese and pastoral center. I got a call before our meeting started and our bishop had gone to her hospital room. She's just right across town to give her uh, the sacrament of confirmation and to pray with her, pray for healing. And Mal made it clear. And this was the whole last year of her life. She made it clear. She said, um, God, I'm praying for healing. And she prayed uh, to Blessed Pierre Giorgio. She wanted to have that second miracle of Blessed Pierre Giorgio to like, we could make him the saint, you know. She said, God, I'm either praying for healing, that if you heal me, you're glorified. And if you don't heal me, I pray that you're glorified. And, and this was like, this was this from a 15 year old who had everything ahead of her in her whole life, hadn't even driven. But her prayer was, God, if you heal me, let that be for your glory. And if you don't heal me, let that be for your glory. And so Beth, I just, um, sometimes God heals us in his love for us. And sometimes God doesn't heal us in his love for us. The biggest thing he can heal, the most, the thing he did that he desires more than anything else is your trust. I know the temptation is towards resentment and disappointment, but the best way that maybe, maybe in this moment that you can glorify God is to say, God, even in the darkness, I still love you. Even in the darkness, I'll still cling to you. So please know of our prayers for you. We'll keep praying for you. Mm -hmm. um, in his love, he heals. And in his love, he sometimes doesn't heal. Yeah, that's great, Father. Thank you so much. Well, that's my last question. So oh, um, the final thing I just want to say was one of the things that I get to do uh, on campus is I get to invite students to different things. And so I work with the athletes and they love a good meal. And so on Thursday nights, we actually have mass and immediately following is a meal. And uh, that's only possible with the donations that we get through Bulldog Catholic. So I invite you to go to bulldogcatholic.org slash donate uh, to be able to continue putting these things on for athletes. So thank you so much, awesome. Father. Thanks, Debbie. I really appreciate it. And now, so these are such great questions. And I'm so grateful you guys. We had our co-host, our first co-host of Lauren, then Abby uh, as a missionary. Now we have the uh, the the director of missionaries, his <laughs> the team director. His name is Noah. You might recognize, if you have ever joined us um, last year, Noah was here with us. And if you've ever joined, sometimes you do the readings for yeah, Sunday, yeah, yeah. Sunday masses. Mm -hmm. But Noah's a team director. He's been a missionary for how many years? Uh, this is my my fourth year as a missionary. And then second year at Duluth. Awesome. So yeah. Noah, tell, that, what's one interesting thing about you? Yeah, um, I am. I'm the youngest of six. I have a great family. I'm also from Iowa. So it seems like good yeah, things yeah. come from Iowa, so. Field of Dreams kind <laughs> of action. Um, youngest of six. Uh, hi, mom. And yeah, <laughs> just, just happy to be here. And Father, the first... The first question, it's kind of a resounding question on the chat, is why am I your favorite focus missionary of all time? Yeah. Why? Okay. That's the, everyone wants to know. Yeah. Everybody wants to know Because it becomes obvious. At, at some point, everyone realizes yeah, it becomes yeah. really clear. Um, and and maybe it speaks for itself. So we can jump to the next question. Oh, yeah. Sure. Bit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but so our, our, our actual first question is from Connie uh, Augustine. She said, how did you create a vibrant focus program on your campus? Wow. Given that it's a public university, this is probably your question, actually. Yeah, it, yeah. No, me and Connie, we collab on this one. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, no. What, what? How would you? How, how would I? How would yeah. you describe the how the focus interacts with 
the yeah. public university. Yeah, I think whether whether it's a public school or a private school, at the at the end of the day, there's there's people on campus who need to know Jesus and want to know Jesus. Um, and I think yeah, coming to this environment, people people are hungry, and our Newman Center has just created a flourishing place for people to come seeking truth and wanting to know Jesus, and then from that Jesus in his church. Um, and so providing people the opportunity not just to know what they believe, but why they believe what they believe. And that has been such a such a joy at Duluth here for my two years, but then also all four of my years with Focus. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a great answer. I also, I would add to that, that um, I one of the things, one of the, the Focus is a lot of incredible stuff. Um, there's Bible studies, there's campus outreach. Uh, but one of the things that they do is something that I've, I had always wanted, um, and that's they disciple others. Yeah. And that can sound, sound like, wait, disciple sounds like, that's a verb. It, yeah, it, it's a noun, you could be a disciple, but you can be discipled. I remember even when I first became like someone alive in my faith, I remember going like, well, who's gonna show me how to do this? Like, how do I, how do I do this? And one of the things the missionaries do, and then they teach others to do it, is they teach them how to walk after the Lord by saying, okay, I mean, kind of model, it's kind of like Paul says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And so that's what Noah and the other missionaries, they'll do is they just walk with so many students and invite them higher. Um, can you say something about the big three? Yeah, the yeah, I can speak of the big three. Um, so our big, the big three. So it's essentially three virtues that uh, college students struggle with in a particular way, uh, being sobriety, chastity and excellence. Um, and so just being able to to meet students where they're at in, in the worldly environment that is the college campus. Uh, and then really, really call them forward in areas of, of sobriety, uh, speaking into these lives, uh, inviting them to live differently than the culture. And then along with that chastity, um, yeah, inviting them to, um, yeah, change their life by giving their, giving that over to the Lord. And then excellence being a little bit of a catch-all, uh, but being an opportunity to live excellently in every moment and allow your heart to be converted in every moment. That's awesome. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Great, great answer. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so our next our next question is going to come from uh, Jesse Walduck. Uh, a few weeks ago, the Sunday mass reading seemed to highlight never call anyone on earth father. Can you shed some light into this? It can sometimes be a talking point with our Protestant friends. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, a great apologetics question, right? It, it, and I, it's kind of like um, there. There's a couple of readings that we do on you know Sundays or even even on Ash Wednesday. Like Ash Wednesday, we have the um, you know, don't, you shouldn't look like you're fasting. And there, that's mm -hmm. the day we are very clearly, obviously with ashes on our forehead or when, um, uh, when, when Jesus is telling the parable of the rich man of Lazarus and the rich man dressed in purple robes, usually we read that during Lent. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wearing purple robes. Yeah. Um, and then also here's the call the man father. And I'm, and I'm the one saying this, uh, hi, I'm father Mike. Don't call him my father. So here's the question. What did Jesus mean? Well, at times we recognize that Jesus is is being very literal in his speech. Hmm. There's other times when Jesus is being figured, he's being hyperbolic to make a point. Hmm. So as an example, um, can Jesus mean, call no man on earth your father, when he, um, when in the scriptures later on, even Paul says, I become your father in Christ. Um, when um, he calls, he says, to call no man a uh, teacher. Well, if you've ever called anyone your teacher, or if you've ever called anyone doctor, doctor means teacher, hmm. um, then you're violating this. If you ever called your dad, dad, then you're calling a man on earth, your father. So the issue is that what's the point of the teaching? And since it seems like we can never take one text out of context because a text out of context can, can become like a pretext for anything. Mm -hmm. And so if we keep the text in context, we realize Jesus is talking about elevating oneself in status as opposed to humbly serving others. So call no one on earth rabbi, call no one on earth teacher, call no one on earth, do not be called, uh, do not be called teacher, call no one your father, um, in that way of lording it over others. So that's that's a really, really brief way that I have not prepared to to, to give uh, other scriptures where you are invited to call people father, um, or when Paul claims fatherhood, um, but at the same time, I think it's legit. <laughs> yeah, let's go, that's an awesome answer. Yeah, thanks. Um, our next, our next uh, user or question comes from the cities from Gopher seven 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 seven. He asks, <laughs> "I really liked Bible in year, did it twice, nice. but catechism in year is making me question my Catholic faith. Seems I'm going to toast for sure because I have worked every Sunday for my whole adult life. Am I doomed?" All right, Gopher. Let's let's, let's find out. <laughs> yeah, let's find out. <laughs> well, go for seven 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 seven. Um, great question. Going to toast for sure. Um, so. Here's the thing. 
I found this, I found this to be the case when it comes to this third pillar of the catechism. And the third pillar of the catechism is where in some ways the rubber hits the road. I mean, yes, the second pillar of worship and where it's like, okay, um, how do I worship God the way he's asked me to? This third pillar of morality or life is like, am I living the way God's asked me to? Now, I we have to realize that God is so patient with us. So go for 7777. Um, it could be the case that you just, I'm discovering this, that you're just realizing that God calls us into Sunday worship and commands us to live Sunday worship in a new way. And it could be like, okay, my whole life, I didn't realize this, or, or I didn't realize the depth of this. But now you do. And so that's just the invitation now. What, what is the next step? How do I respond to this? And that just, I've been so like, I've been, ah, gosh, what is, what's the way to say this? I've been so um, moved by the, the difference between agreement and faith. So I made a video on this a little while ago because mm. it's just it's so compelling. But agreement is like, okay, you've, you've told me what the church teaches. You told me why the church teaches. I, I agree. I agree. I'll do that. I, I, that's, that's, I agree. That's not bad. It's good. It's good to ask questions. It's good to want, know what, good to know why. Yeah. But faith is not, I'm agreeing to a proposition. Faith is I'm trusting a person. It's very, very different. And so if it's agreement, like, okay, demonstrate to me that this is what God wants me to do and I'll do it. Okay, that's fine. I don't know if you've ever realized, I don't know if you ever noticed this, maybe you guys have never noticed this. Whenever God calls someone in the Bible, they never stop and say, why? They, they've never, I don't know if there's any one story ever of someone in the Bible who God called them to something and they said, how come? Now, it doesn't mean that you can't, you and I can't ask how come or can't ask why, but it does highlight the difference between agreement. I wanna know what, I wanna know why. That's great, that's not, not a problem. But faith, faith is not just, I agree with the proposition, but faith is, I trust in a person. So go for seven, 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 seven. <laughs> what is the Lord calling you to do today? That's the question. You might say, I built a life around working on Sundays. All right, what is God calling you to do as you move forward? Now, it might not be the most obvious answer, but ultimately what it's gonna be is he's inviting you to take a step in faith, which means I'm gonna take a step in trusting the one who's calling me to worship him on the day he rose from the dead. So I hope that you continue to engage, engage in this. Um, don't write yourself off too quickly. Again, that's the last thing I'll say. Mm -hmm. Don't write yourself off too quickly and say, well, I'm going to hell for sure. Not necessarily, like there's time to change. So not just agreement with a proposition, but trust in a person and your story isn't over yet. Nice. Yeah. That's Hopefully awesome. Helps. Thanks. Sweet. That's so good. Okay, Father, this question is from GD. Hi, Father Mike. What is your favorite food? Mm. I would say I can narrow it down to three things in no particular order. Okay, actually, I, I, here's the question. Steak. Okay, steak. Yep. Anyone else? Pizza. pizza yeah. Yes. Sushi. Sushi. Yes. Wow. Well known. Um, steak, pizza, sushi. You know, those are those are the three foods that I think I could eat round the clock at any given moment. I could do that. Good question. Thanks, GD. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay. Um, Father, is that, is that all the time for me? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. We, <laughs> we are going to be, we're going to be handing it off here to the queen of Newman in a second, but before I say, uh, before I go, um, this has been a blast. Thank you so much. Just this, this Newman center for focused missionaries gets to kind of act as our, as our base of operations. So From there, potentially walking with them in discipleship and always leading them back to Jesus is is such a gift. But we can't do it without this new center that we have here. So we're currently at 65% of our goal for the day. Um, so thank you so much for watching. But if you'd like to donate, um, you can click a link in the chat. Um, but then also you can go to bulldogcatholic.org slash donate. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Father. Thanks, Noah. You guys, that was Noah. As I mentioned, he's been on campus for two years. Someone who's been on campus for vastly longer than two years is Heather, and Heather is our coordinator here on campus. And Heather, um, when did you first arrive at at UMD Full Dog Newman? Seventeen years ago. Seventeen years ago. So she's at least seventeen years old. Uh, at and least. So, <laughs> and so, Heather, what's uh, what's our first question? Uh, first question is from Nissa Sanchez. What does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God? What does that look like? How do we approach that? Great question, Nisa. Um, what does it look like to seek first the kingdom of God? I would say, uh, well, uh, initially it's this. It is 
God, I want to do your will before anything else. So it's just asking that question, God, what is your will? And so, so um, before I say, uh, God, uh, what do I want to do? Before I even ask the question of what other people want me to do, I basically get something in my heart that says, okay, ultimately, God, what I want to do is I want to do your will. That that's that's the first thing. And so so it isn't just about um, tasks. It isn't just about actions. It's about the heart. So if I'm going to seek for the kingdom of God, what I'm seeking is what we, what we pray in the Our Father, like in the Lord's Prayer, when we say, "Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven." That's what it is to seek first the kingdom, to be able to say, God, your will be done more than anything. Now, how do we do that is a big question. And so, but keep in mind, it's not just about externals first. It's first about internal. So that desire to be able to say, even if I fail at this, God, I want your will to be done in my life. To be able to have that, thy will be done before anything else. That will be. Done. <laughs> Secondly, how do I practically do this? I think one practical way is um, what says seek first. You know, you probably are aware of this, Nisa. Um, but biblically speaking, at the end of a day, a week, a month, a season, people in the covenant they were invited or commanded to give their first fruits to the Lord. And so if I'm going to seek first anything, what it means is like something gets to, something has to come first. If I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God, that means the kingdom of God has to come first. And how does that, what does that look like? Well, it looks like, hey, God, you get my first fruits. God, you get, in some ways, God, you get the best of me. How, what's, and I, I like think, thinking it like this. What is the most important thing you have? The most important thing you have is your time. Almost everything else that you and I have is is replenishable, right? It's renewable. You, if you lose your money, you can get more money. If you lose your health, maybe you can't get your health. I don't know, but but time is one thing that is incredibly finite. It is non-renewable resource. Because of that, it's so incredibly valuable. So the question I get to ask is, does God get my first fruits of my day? And what I mean by that is not just, does is, is prayer the first thing I do? What I mean by that is the is prayer the first thing I schedule? That if I have anything on my schedule for Monday, for Tuesday, whatever day it is, is prayer the first thing that gets scheduled? If it's not, then maybe I'm not seeking first God's kingdom. Maybe I'm not placing him and his will first. So just as a quick litmus test is, uh, and you say, well, my work is first thing scheduled because I have to go there. I gotcha. What you, how about your first thing that you schedule with your disposable time? We'll say it like that. If you have to work from eight o'clock to six o'clock, okay, what's the first thing you schedule outside of those work hours? That would be a good indicator of whether or not God is first. Thanks, Father. Yeah. Our next question is from Mike Schiff of Atlas Strength and Conditioning. Awesome. What hey, Mike. Would, what would you suggest for someone struggling with guilt or shame even after going to reconciliation? Great question. We have a video on that. So if you want to take a look at that, I don't remember what I said. So I'm going to do my best to try to answer that in a fresh way. But if you type in something along those lines, like still feel bad after confession, I think I made a video like that. Um, one thing you have to ask is... Um, is this true guilt or is this false guilt? Is this true shame or is this false shame? What I mean by that is when it's guilt, it's have I really done this thing? Have I, is, is what I've done, is it actually wrong? So am I actually guilty? Sometimes we feel guilty when we shouldn't feel guilty. There's actually times when someone else can do something that has hurt you or hurt me. And we're the ones who feel bad about it. And in those moments, I think what the Lord, the, the Lord who's the God of truth, and the Holy Spirit, who's the God of conviction, who like who reveals the truth, would be able to say, wait a second, but you're that's not your fault. And sometimes it's really important for us to understand that the wounds we carry are sometimes not our fault. And we can feel guilty for them, but it's misplaced guilt. So just keep that in mind. If that's the case, then just be able to acknowledge, okay, I, I, I will never be able to get past misplaced guilt, or I'll never be, I will never be able to get past false guilt because you can't do anything with it. It's not yours to hold on to, it's not yours to, to keep. And so if it's false guilt or misplaced guilt, we just have to realize that's just a lie. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, okay, I go to confession. I still feel badly. What do you feel badly about? It could be, I feel badly, you know, when it comes to shame, I, I like some people say the difference between guilt and shame is, is um, guilt is when you realize you've done something wrong. Uh, shame is when you say that I'm wrong. 
and I don't know. I, that's fine. It's a good. That's a good distinction. I really, I, I like a different definition of guilt and shame. Guilt is when I violated a certain objective standard. So, truth is the standard, and I've lied. So I violated that standard of truth. Shame is more relational. Shame is when I know that you know that I violated that standard. So if it's just guilt, it's like, oh yeah, no, I, I, I broke the law, or broke the rule, whatever the thing is. I failed to live up to the, be the person I'm called to be. Shame is when I know you know that I've failed to live up, live up to be that person. So, so that means when if I'm guilty, I'm I can look you in the eye still, but if I have shame, I can't look you in the eye because I know you know, right? So I think I think shame is more more relational. So the question I have to ask is, if I'm feeling if I'm feeling shame after I still go to confession, it could be because I know that you know what I had to confess, that in your eyes you know that I'm not perfect. In your eyes, you know that I'm the kind of person who would lie or a person who would cheat or steal, whatever the thing is. And then I just have to realize that I'm being called to humility in, those, in that moment. Because why? Because if it's true, <laughs> the thing is, if it's true, then it's true. Like if I cheated and someone found out that I cheated and they think that I'm a cheat, it's true, I cheated. And so I just have to have the humility to be able to say, yep, someone out there knows the truth about me. And it just... I don't know. I don't know to say other than than to, to embrace the truth and just humility and say, "Yep, that is." Uh, I, I don't want to say the same thing five times, but it's true. I would recommend the litany of humility in those moments, and say, "Okay, someone knows the truth." And if it's not true, then you don't carry it, right? If they think you did something you didn't do, then you don't have to carry it. It's not yours. You're Andy Dufresne walking this walk in the halls of Shawshank like right you're you're a free man even though you're in prison the other thing is this sometimes we feel guilt or shame because there's a consequence that uh my my choices people have to live with like it's paying someone has to pay the price for my decisions so not just like it's relational I feel shame because you know I know that you know that I did this thing sometimes it's I made a decision and now you're paying the price and this could be the case for any one of us where it's um I went to confession, I know I'm forgiven, but I ruined someone's life. Like they, uh, my lie or my gossiping destroyed a relationship or, or my choice hurt someone physically or, or maybe it took their life. Like that, that kind of guilt, that kind of shame is there's a consequence to my action that I can't undo. In those moments, again, just we have to dive deeply into mercy. And what we can do, I think, I think what we can do is we can say, okay, God, I can't go back and change this, but I can give it to you. Meaning, meaning I can't go back and change this, but I can surrender it to you. I can place it under your dominion. And that might sound like a cop-out, but it's not. So there are so many times when, for myself, when I'm like, oh my gosh, I have just hurt someone in a way that I cannot unhurt them. And I can't go back in time. I do not have a DeLorean that, that can take me back. Um, I just have to deal with this but I can't on my own. And so what I've regularly done is say, God, I just place this under your Lordship. I, pay, I place the past that I've chosen under your Lordship. I place the present that I can't undo. I place that under your Lordship as well. And um, just walk forward in humility and trust. That was a longer answer, but that's what I think. Good answer. Thanks. On a lighter note. <laughs> From Kelly Cutler. Hello, Father Mike. What is your favorite thing to do in your downtime? And what is your favorite movie? Okay, great question, Kelly. Um, I, I probably would say that the, um, I maybe exercise probably would be the, the, the thing that I would do more than anything if I'm not working. Um, that Yeah, that's the quick, was that accurate? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I try to think. He's like, yeah. <laughs> um, favorite movie? That's just you. I don't even know. So I would say it's a, uh, it's a Wonderful Life would be one of maybe one of my all time favorites. Um, for whatever reason, Braveheart's on my mind these days. I like that one a lot. But also, man, there's so many good movies. So we'll just we'll just stick with It's a Wonderful Life, even though. Yeah. No. Not, no. No. Even though that was good. Yeah. Good. Oh. Thanks, Kelly. I thought that was going to be a longer answer. No. Our next question <laughs> comes from Karina Ramirez. Our dear father, could you shed some light on? End of world predictions. My dad follows the predictions of some clergy members, which he turned to into a climate of fear at home. As an adult, I'm seeking clarity. Yes, Karina, great question. Um, see, whenever it comes to end of world predictions, the most important thing we have to realize is that Jesus dealt with that as well. People in the scriptures and in the, in the gospels had asked Jesus, like, when when's the end of the world, world going to come? And uh, basically he said, you won't know. <laughs> 
That's the answer. And so anyone trying to figure it out, anyone trying to figure out the end of the world stuff is they're literally doing exactly what Jesus told them not to do. That, that trying to figure that out is, is an exercise in futility because Jesus said, you will never know the day or the hour, but, but the son of man will come like a thief in the night when, when no one's expecting him. And so people who figured it out, they've never figured it out. And so I would just be able to, to say that, um, that one, that first thing, first thing, I shouldn't have to say anything else after that, I think, because <laughs> when Jesus says, you're not going to know, and you're trying to figure it out, I'm like, oh, okay, well, it's fine. um, the second thing is, why would I want to know? Here's a big question. Why, why would anyone want to know? And the answer I think is because I want, I want to be prepared. I want to be prepared. Um, makes sense. Not bad. If you're a boy scout, you know, that's the motto, right? Be prepared, but we don't get prepared by knowing the day or the hour. We get prepared by being ready, no matter what the day or the hour. That's the key. So how can I get my heart ready? How can I live in such a way that I'm, whenever the day is, whenever the hour is, that um, God will find me doing his will. That God will find me trying to live an upright life. That God will find me on my knees, um, literally or figuratively, asking for his grace. So again, we the only way we can be prepared when we don't know the day or the hour is to be ready no matter what the day, no matter what the hour. And to do anything more than that is, I think, to go against what Jesus had very clearly told us to do. Hopefully that helps, Karina. Thank you. Uh, before I go, I'm going to turn it over to Gabby. I just, one of my favorite things about working in this ministry is our students and the opportunity to witness them saying yes to the Lord every day, um, regard, regardless if it's um, spending time in prayer being a part of this community, um, saying yes to retreats and conferences. And it's a joy for me. I get to plan all of those retreats and to just see them encounter our Lord in a real way, in adoration, in confession. That's my very favorite place is to watch them line up for confessions and just see God's mercy showing up. And so if you would continue, your support makes those retreats possible. Please join us at bulldogcatholic.org slash donate. Thanks, Heather. That's awesome. Um, also, with that, um, they're all like cheering. Um, um, also, one of the things we might be doing as we move forward, sometimes people ask the question again, the very, very, very first question of the night was what's next um, after the Bible in a year and catechism in a year. We're looking at um, some opportunities to, to expand what we do here out to the world, to, out to where you are. And so um, Heather mentioned like retreats and conferences and things. We are looking at ways to expand and like the retreats that we lead our students on here to be able to make those accessible to you um, online. And so it's one of the ways we're trying to, uh, yeah, bring, uh, I guess I'd say it for the third time, bring what we do here to where you are there. Um, that was Heather. This, our next uh, co-host, our last co-host of the night is Gabby. Gabby, how are you doing? Good. Father, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing well, thanks. <laughs> um, Gabby is from Western Washington. She's from the furthest away. Um, <laughs> She's out from the West Coast. And um, Gabby, can you tell us about yourself a little bit? Yeah, I'm a first year missionary here. Um, like Father said, I'm from the West Coast, um, Paulsville, Washington specifically. And I went to what, school at Western Washington University, Scovikes. Um, <laughs> and now I get to be here serving on this campus. Which is, is amazing. So her, your Western Washington, the mas mascot is the Vikings. Which mm -hmm. I wish I wish we were the Vikings here. I wish UMD was the Vikings. I could I'm gonna put in I'm gonna write that we change the Bulldogs to the Vikings because I would want to be I want to be a Viking. Anyways, but she came to the right place from Western Washington to the land of the Vikings. So um, we're grateful that you're here. Thanks, Father. Thanks. Grateful to be here. <laughs> um, our first question comes from Kind Jewels, and they say, "Hello, Father Mike. Thank you for everything you do in the name of Jesus. Sending love from Ireland. Let's go." <laughs> um, my question is, in what ways do you especially feel God's presence in your life? Wow. Wow. Um, so the username is kind of jewels, unless that's your actual name, which is incredible. And you're from Ireland, right? She said Ireland. Mm -hmm. We got um, Gabby to this because she has the red hair. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we planned it out. Um, so what, what was it again? I just got so distracted. Um, are, what ways? In what ways do you especially feel God's presence mm. in your life? Man. Okay. Great question. Maybe a, here's I. Here's one of the things I would say this, I would say that, um, I remember when I first came to know the Lord, um, and came to realize that God is real and that I needed to pray and I needed to like walk a certain way in life. Not that I did it perfectly. I'm just saying that I, I knew this was the goal. I knew this was the priority. 
Um, I, one of the things I had to learn was that faith isn't a feeling. That's that's a thing. Or God's presence isn't a feeling. And so that was really, really important for me to learn. And I, I mentioned when Noah was on that I really longed for, to be discipled. I really longed to have someone to walk with me and show me the way. Um, I didn't have anyone in person. I mean, there were people around me, but they did not, didn't have that specific role. Mm-hmm. I had great people, great parents, family, you know, good church and everything. But I had great books. And and one of the things I would I would read these authors who would remind me that what I was experiencing in the sense that I didn't like feel a lot, um, that that was okay. And that, that that was normal, that that faith isn't a feeling, that our faith is based on facts and sometimes feelings follow, but I can't base my faith on feelings. I have to base my faith on facts and then sometimes feelings follow. So there are times where like, like Heather mentioned, we have retreats and we're in adoration. And I was like, this is awesome. This is incredible. Like, I just love that we're like, get to pray with people or even sometimes in, in, in confession, that giving absolution is just like, sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, Fulton Sheen once said, um, he said, priests sometimes forget. They need to remember this. That is, they extend their hand over the, the head of the penitent, over the head of the person that's asking for forgiveness. And we trace the sign of the cross over them. The blood of Jesus Christ drips off our fingers. The blood of God's mercy drips off our fingers. And sometimes I, I imagine that. I almost get like choked up in those moments. And so I can, but it's, so it's it's those moments where I'm like, a lot of times it's like, no, I'm just doing God's will. You know, best I can, showing up and pray. And there's moments though, adoration and prayer, uh, where it's just like, oh my goodness, Lord. Um, this is real and you're real and you're, you're doing something here. The last thing I would say is, um, I was talking, someone asked me about this yesterday. I was, uh, riding in a car with, um, actually, how about this? So I have a niece who goes here. She transferred, she's a sophomore and her name is Heidi. And, um, so Heidi and I had dinner last Sunday night after mass. She's like, Uncle Mike, we, we haven't hung out. You know, why don't we, I'm like, I guess Heidi, let's do it. So we hung out after mass. We had dinner and we're just talking about whatever. And at one point she said, um, she's like, so I'm going to change, I'm going to, I'm going to change topics. And I was like, okay, great. She says, how are you doing with grandma? So with my mom, my mom, my mom, you know, passed away in February, last February. And I was like, oh my gosh, Heidi, thank you. So, I mean, I was so proud of her for like mm-hmm. being a sophomore and just saying like, no, let's talk about some real stuff here. And, and just, how are you doing with grandma? How are you doing with your mom? You know? And, and I was like, oh my gosh, Heidi, thank you so much for it. So he talked about it and I asked her, how are you? You know, and all this. And, and it was really, it was, it was the, it was a highlight, uh, such a huge highlight, because I realized this. I realized that sometimes I don't know what I feel until I say it out loud, or until I find try to find the words. And so I'm like always, you know, praying for my mom and praying to my mom for her her intercession. But sometimes it's just something about being able to speak about the Lord or speak about someone, speak about um, our faith out loud. That that's when I I uh, it touches my heart touches my heart. And so I, sometimes I don't know what I'm feeling until I say it. And so I'm so gra- glad that she had asked me about that because it was like, oh, this is, I think my my mouth is directly connected to my heart. And so I most feel God's presence, I think, in those moments of prayer. But also, I mean, when I when I get a chance to talk about the Lord, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. totally. Let me see. Um, this next question comes from a user called BW. Um, how do you help someone understand the beauty and importance of the rosary when they say it is a rote prayer? Yeah, B dubs. Uh, great question. The rosary is a rote prayer. Yep. I mean, it is. <laughs> that's that. It. It's repetition, and and that's uh, that's part of the beauty of this. I mean, think about mm-hmm. how often, um, how often we actually are so scattered in the course of our our day. I mean, I don't know if, if that's you. But so often I'm doing three things at once. Like I, I remember I, I, there was one a time, a recent uh, plane plane ride where I was listening to an audiobook, was watching a movie on my screen, watching a movie on the person's next to me screen, watching a movie on the person ahead of me's screen and trying to follow the, the game on the other screen across the aisle. And I'm like, okay, this is normal. <laughs> and I'm like, and that's not normal. That's, that's People shouldn't live like this. The rosary centers us in so many ways. It, it, it strips away all these other things and says, just one thing, just do this one thing. Now our brains are such that we want to do more. Like we, our brains are such that we want to go race after all the other thoughts. The rosary as like this like chain or the rosary as this rope holds our thoughts together. And so the fact that it's, no, it's just this one thing. It's just this one prayer, just this one mystery, just this one decade, whatever the thing is, it, it holds our, our minds, our hearts, our thoughts together and keeps us united, I think. Now, 
It's not merely that. It doesn't only do that. We also get a chance to meditate deeply on the scenes of Christ's life. And so that's we recognize. I always point out that um, that when we pray the rosary, if I'm just focused on the words, um, it's going to be pretty, it's going to be, it can be beautiful, but it's going to be pretty, uh, it's, out, it's only going to go so deep. The people who first originally taught the rosary taught the rosary in context of the mysteries of Christ's life. And the idea was, as you're holding on to this rope, right, as you're holding on to these prayers, you now have the freedom to dive deeply into that scene in Jesus's life. So if I stay on the surface, it's going to stay surface. But maybe I need that because on the surface with one unifying thought is way better than being distracted. But we're meant to actually go deeper by meditating on those scenes of Jesus' life. What do you think? I would agree with that. I love the rosary. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. Me too. Um, this next question um, actually ties in really well with the, the last one. It's from Sabrina Benink, and it's she says, Hello, Father. I pray every day, but I rarely feel anything, and I'm easily distracted. I often feel distant from God. What, if anything, can be done about this? Sabrina, great question. Um, one of the things as we come back to this is just to realize, okay, there's this is normal. Like, it's really normal uh, to be distracted. In fact, we're going to get to the fourth uh, pillar of the catechism, and there's a whole mm -hmm. section in the, the, the <laughs> in the pillar on prayer called the Battle of Prayer. And it will talk about the battle of distractions. And, and so what St. Therese of Lisieux would say that if you're distracted, the one thing you don't do is panic. Like the one thing you don't do when you're in prayer and are distracted is panic. She'd say, just, just gently recognize, or she says, calmly recognize you're distracted and gently bring your attention back to the Lord. And if she said, if in a holy hour, you find yourself having to do that a thousand times, then simply do that a thousand times. Do it gently, patiently with yourself. But to recognize that like our brains are always moving. This is very, I think this, this helped me out a lot when I, I read it in a book that talked about this distraction and prayer and in, pointed out like, we think we're holding a thought in our, brain, in our mind, but you're not holding a thought in your mind. Your brain is constantly firing. And because it's constantly firing, you're gonna have to constantly be bringing it back to focus. And so to, to not be disheartened by that. Now, at the same time, there also would be, um, Distracted, distracted, dry. What <laughs> can't read or speak? <laughs> Apologize. But she said she I rarely feel anything. So Sabrina, if you rarely feel anything in prayer, that is normal. Pause on that for a second. Sometimes we read the Bible and we hear stories of like, wow, this is uh God appeared to Moses in the burning bush and he said to do this. Um, oh, God spoke to Abraham and called him from his homeland. Uh God spoke to whoever, the person, the, the prophet, and he had to say this thing. Realize that, say, in Moses' life, which was like 100 plus years, God speaks to him like six times. I mean, it's, it's it, I don't know, I'm exaggerating, but it's not every day. It's not every time he would go to pray. Or Abraham, God sent Abraham on the way, on the way, and didn't, we have no evidence that he talked to God or that he talked to Moses on a regular basis in this obvious way every day along the way. So to not feel anything in prayer is not a bad thing. Why? Because the goal of prayer is not feeling. That's not the goal of prayer. The goal of prayer is spending time with your father so that your heart becomes like his. It's spending time with your father so you can become like him. So your heart becomes like his. And so I think that if you just realize, oh, the goal of prayer isn't to feel anything. And, and most people, I would say, when I say most, I mean 100% of people don't feel anything when they're praying for the most part. So it's very, very normal. The goal of prayer is not to feel anything. The goal of prayer is to spend time with the Lord, to learn what he's like and to become like him. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Right. Awesome. Yeah. Um, great. Our next question comes from Andrea or Andrea de Fran Fred, sorry, de Francesco. Um, your students have learned a lot from you, but what's something they you have sure learned? have, <laughs> <laughs> but what is something that you have learned from them? Oh, I, you know, that's a really good question. Andrea, um, or Andrea, one of the two, um, that's it, man. So I would say I learn a lot from the missionaries. Like, so er, all the time I'm learning from the missionaries also from the students, um, the missionaries, I, I, I get to learn what, um, I'm reminded of what, uh, I see zeal in them so so regularly. I see this pursuit. You know, Noah mentioned the big three: sobriety, chastity, and excellence. I see this pursuit after excellence um, in them, which is is just remarkable. It's it's so inspiring. It's it's amazing. Um, for our students, 
I, I'm in awe oftentimes of how uh, much better they are than me in the sense of I <laughs> There's so many times when, even like in prayer, when people are sharing stuff out loud in prayer, and I think of like the smart alecky thing to say, and I realize that if I was their age, I would say I would say it, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so grateful I'm almost 50 because I don't say it now. But they're they're 18 and they're not saying the the funny line. I'm super super grateful that they take things seriously and they have these sober lives. Um, but also, I would I would recognize that um, I just learn I I my lack I think. That, that that's I don't know that's the most honest answer I can think of is that um, the thing I learned from them the most is how far I have to go. Uh, it is uh, someone was saying this the other day. Uh, they reminded me a lot of times. A lot of times, if I we do the podcast, we do this kind of stuff, and and sometimes people will be like, you know, Father Mike, you're so holy or whatever. And I'm like, Fulton Sheen once said, he said, um, it's really easy to talk about being holy it's really hard to be holy. And so what I get to do is I get to talk about being holy. Um, this, this, our students, they reveal how far I have to go um, and actually being like Jesus. And so that's one thing they remind me of all the time. So that's a good question. Thanks, Sabrina. Not, no, Andrea. Thanks, Andrea. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Students here are awesome. They are. Um, so that actually concludes my time on the camera with Father. Um, but before I go, I just wanted to say, um, yeah, I have the honor to be here with so many students and get to hear their stories and how they've come to encounter the Lord. Um, and the theme that I've heard a lot is just the community here um, and the different events that get to foster that community. Um, and that is definitely a result of your prayers as well as your funding. Um, so I just want to invite you, um, if you yeah, feel called to donate, um, to go either to the link in the comments below um, or the description below or go to bulldogcatholic.org slash donate. Awesome. Thanks, Gabby. Awesome. Thanks, Father. Appreciate it. Okay, you guys, um, we said that we were going to have um, Lauren and then Abby, then Noah, then Heather, then Gabby, and that was it. That was just going to be done. But you had no idea. We have a special guest co-host, <laughs> and he is like no other. He um, He's what he would say. He can do it all. He might even be known as a Jack of all trades. Um, <laughs> Jack, Come on. Jack is Jack is our first year. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. Jack's our first year missionary here on campus. But you didn't come from very far away. I didn't. Um, I went to school in Duluth, so I went to undergrad at the College of Saint Scholastica, and didn't go very far to go there because I grew up an hour north of here in a city <laughs> called Virginia, Minnesota. So you went from the furthest away, Gabby, yes, to the closest. Yep. Right at home. Right at home. <laughs> and Jack Jack lives in the house closest to this house, right yes. across the road. Yes, it's a blessing to just be an alley, an alleyway away from Jesus in the Eucharist, in the tabernacle. And it's awesome to just um, spontaneously stroll into the chapel and say hi to Jesus and say That's hi awesome. to Father Mike and <laughs> be on my merry way. Uh, speaking of being on your merry way. Yes. Um, part of the reason that I'm <laughs> back in Duluth. Um, typically fo focused missionaries don't get sent to their alma mater to where they came from, but I did because my beautiful wife who's off screen, you'll see her later. Um, <laughs> she is still in school at the college of St. Scholastica. So we got married this summer and focus was so kind to keep us together. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Focus. Not to sleep. Thank you focus. <laughs> okay. Father, I have a question for you from AJ Gatto. He says, Hey, Father Mike, thank you for all that you do. You've helped me so much. I was wondering which parable of Jesus is your favorite. And which one do you go to the most to help people? Man, wow, that's a really good question. Mm. AJ, AJ, thank you so much. Okay, so one of them, there's here's here's three that come up right 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 away. Um, the first one is uh, the story of the rich man and Lazarus, like because it's the most convicting. It is it's so convicting of recognizing what um, what the Lord is 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 calling all of us to do is like to recognize Jesus in the poorest of the poor. The second parable that I I love is that with this parable this weekend. It's mm -hmm. the parable of the talents. And so I, I think that's also so inspiring because it's like, no, God has given all of us gifts. We have to use them or um, we don't honor the Lord. And I think the third parable would be the one we're going to hear the weekend after mm -hmm. this weekend, which is Matthew 25, where the parable of the sheep and the goats. And it's for the same reason as the first parable, where at the end, just, you know, Jesus, the, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, he separates all humanity and to those who saw him naked and fed or clothed him, saw him hungry and, and fed him, and those who saw him and didn't. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why I like it is not because I do those things, it's because I realize when Jesus gave us that parable, those parables, 
he's giving us the answers to the quiz. Like the, 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 the final exam, he's giving us the answers. And I just, whenever I read that, I'm reminded of, man, again, like I said, with the students, I have so far to go. And, um, and it, it, it convicts me and just uh, makes me scared. <laughs> so I need to do that more, you know? Nice. Those are three really good examples. Yeah, thanks. I love those parables. Okay. Carolyn Berbari. This is what she says. Hi, Father. Thank you for your ministry. My son is watching with me and has so many questions. Mm. Can you answer this for him? Does God's will for us change based on our decisions or is it set in stone? Awesome question. Carolyn? Carolyn. Carolyn. Great question. And also your son's question is awesome. So here's what we'd say. Here's what I would say, at least. Um, God's ultimate will for every one of us is that we would live with him forever in heaven. That, that, that's his will. That's his, that's his call for every person, regardless of, of what direction we, we choose, regardless of what vocation, like you know, kind of lowercase v vocation we choose. God, that will never, ever change. God's will for us in that sense will always be that he wants us to be with him forever in heaven. At the same time, I have this image. Um, we've had we've had people in, I've had people in my life, whether it be on campus or I just knew them growing up and um, they're often somewhere else, you know, not in Duluth or anywhere. So here's a young woman and uh, she's discerning consecrated religious life. And, and, it, and all the signs point to like, I really think she's called to this. Like it really seems clear that she's called to be a religious sister and whatever happens uh this and that happens she starts seeing some guy and she gets pregnant and so that what seemed like a really clear call in some ways like maybe that was god's will for her life that he wanted her to be religious sister that was her vocation that might change the route but it doesn't change the destination so yeah her circumstances of her life now would be very, very different. But it doesn't mean that now she's destined to, to like misery and maybe heaven at the end. No, it means that God will work. The thing is, you've probably heard this analogy before, but I would say it like this, uh, that God is, <laughs> the closest thing we have to God is GPS. But what I mean by that is uh, that you put in the destination and you take the wrong wrong direction. What does it do? It doesn't yell at you. It doesn't berate you. It doesn't insult you. It doesn't say you're stupid. It doesn't say you don't get to go to the destination anymore. It says simply says rerouting finding the next best route. And I think that the Lord God is so patient with us and so good with us. His grace is so alive and active that it's not set it and forget it ever. It's God works with our choices. And he says, okay, I didn't want you over here, but I'm going to meet you over here. And that, that is true. That is real. I don't want you over here, but I'll meet you over here. And I'm going to get you to, if you keep saying yes, I'll get you to where I wanted you to go in the first place. So I hope that helps Carolyn, you and your son. Yeah, that's awesome. What do you think? Yeah. I agree with everything that you said. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think disagreeing with you would look bad. <laughs> no, fine, fine, but I don't you. disagree with you. Okay. I completely agree with, you, with you, everything you said. Great. Um, I think this is our final question of the night. So before we do this, um, I just, yeah, we'd just like to thank each of you who have so generously donated to us tonight. Um, it is it is truth that your riches are stored up in heaven. Um, and just so grateful for, for those that support this ministry because Emily and I went, through marriage prep here with Father Mike. And he got, we was able to attain resources and different things in order to prepare us for marriage um, in a way that will set us up for eternity. Well, not eternity, but as, until we die, um, <laughs> which is a long time, hopefully. So for the next decades of our life, we were able to figure out and learn about how to be married um, in this very place because of your contribution. So again, tonight before the last question, we just ask you um, to go to bulldogcatholic.org slash donate and make a contribution that you're able to make. Um, and it greatly helps us. Um, and this last question, I think we're inviting everyone onto the screen. Yeah, and I think this so. last question is father and everyone, what is your favorite Bible verse? Favorite Bible verse. Go on. Yes. Get into the, get into the thing. Um, as, as people are getting into the, into the frame, one thing you might notice that Jack has a bulldog Catholic t-shirt. You may notice that I have this bulldog Catholic, uh, a zip up vest, you know, I don't know if anyone has that or their swag on. Uh, if you want any to order any merch, we have like a merch store online. I'm not sure if we're gonna put it in the show notes after this, but it's bulldogcatholic.merchology something. We'll put it in the in the notes, <laughs> but it, none of the proceeds go to Bulldog Catholic. It's just, it's all, all of the profits go to making the, the, the garment. So we don't make any money off of it. But if you wanted to like your rep Bulldog, you can stay here, Jack. Oh, thanks sure. Gabby, come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you wanted to go and check it out, um, there'll be a link in the post post show kind of notes if you want to go and maybe get some christmas presents for someone who is a fan of bulldog catholic so um we're gonna go from this side all the way across to that side so favorite scripture verses 
Matthew 15, 16. Who do you say that I am? Awesome. The entire Psalm 37. What's what's that one go? How's it go? I don't have that one. What what summarize it? Summarize it. Um, it's about it's about being still with the Lord. Like it's very good. I don't know the number, but I know it's I can do all things through, through Christ who strengthens me. Nice. Um, Psalm sixty three. What's Oh God, you are my God. It is you that I see. <laughs> verse one. <laughs> Uh, Matthew 7, 24 through 29, hearers and doers. What, what? on the rock. Oh, nice. Stand. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Who else? Um, my favorite is Jeremiah 31, 13, let the young women dance. <laughs> 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 uh, mine is also Matthew 15, 16, but who do you say that? Mm. Okay, I like Sirach 2.18, um, for equal to his majesty is his mercy. Mm. Nice. Mine is Matthew 22, verses 37 through 39. Um, love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, mine is 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 7. It is for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and self-control. That is amazing. These are all really, really good. I did not think of mine. Um, so I'm going to say a couple, maybe the Sirach <laughs> 2, verse 1. Uh, my son, when you come to serve the Lord, prepare yourself for trials. That might be one. Um, but also uh, when Jesus in Gospel Gospel John, he says to his disciples, he says, um, in this world, you will have trouble, but have courage. I have, for I have overcome the world. So you guys, I'm so grateful for you to join us tonight. And we're right on time. <laughs> give, or, give or take. Um, thank you so much for all of you who joined the live stream. And if you didn't join the live stream, you're watching this on a recorded version. Also know that we are so grateful for you. We're praying for all of you. And for all of us here at Bulldog Catholic, um, God bless. Bye. Bye. Hooray. <laughs> Are we still <laughs> 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 It's like the end of the office. <laughs> <laughs>